we want to have this green energy transition, it inherently means an increase on critical mineral demand. And that inherently means that we have to proceed forward with mining practices. I've recently conducted several interviews with geoscientists from various industries, the environmental sector, oil and gas, mining, research in academia, and I've noticed a repeating pattern and sentiment from all of these geoscientists. And that is, not everything is black or white. Almost everything in geology and our path toward a sustainable future is some shade of gray. So what does this mean? Well, everyone I've talked to has pointed out that people who care about the environment tend to think that everything green energy is good and everything that's extractive is bad. And that's not to say that I love mining or anything, right? Or don't see that mining is problematic, but there exists this disconnect in people's brains, right? Because we're super removed from where the materials that make the things that we use in every day of our life, right? If your cell phone, <laughs> right, has copper in it, your solar panels, your lithium battery in your phone or in your car, we're very removed from where where these materials come from. So if we want to have this green energy transition, it inherently means an increase on critical mineral demand. And that inherently means that we have to proceed forward with mining practices. Okay, so if we want to have this transition, we have to mine for critical minerals. But what are critical minerals? The Energy Act of 2020 defines critical minerals as those that are essential to the economic or national security of the United States. So critical minerals don't necessarily include fuel minerals or water or ice or snow, and they don't necessarily include things like gravel or sand or stone or pumice or clay. All of those are non-renewable resources that we use all of the time, but specifically critical minerals are those in which we use to have like a either manufacturing or the production of energy. So for example, lithium is very important to the rechargeable batteries that we're using currently, the mo like modern technology for rechargeable batteries. Rare earth elements are incredibly important in all sorts of electronics and also in magnets that make wind turbines go. So we're thinking beyond what we would typically consider like an earth resource, but it's also beyond what we've thought about traditionally, right? Gold, silver, copper, that sort of thing. And they go on to mention the importance of understanding the geology of what we are extracting in order to maximize our efficiency and minimize our environmental impact. If we want to go forward with this idea of moving towards more sustainable energy dynamics, solar, wind, and then ultimately battery capacity and storage, we need to increase the capacity of resource extraction across the world. And there's kind of two ways you can do that. You can do it purely by a profit and kind of greenwashing standpoint, right? Go in and take as much mass, as much stuff as you can, as quickly as you can, build the batteries and it looks really good. Or you can go in with understanding the petrologic and the geochemical processes, both forming these deposits that should be mined and requiring us to extract the rare earth elements and the heavy metals of interest and use that knowledge to minimize the environmental impact of our progress towards more sustainable energy. But this isn't the first time that we've been faced with these options. The reason we were able to have the Industrial Revolution is that we figured out geologic mapping and we could predictably locate where resources were. And throughout the theme, I think it's important to highlight that as we learned more, we switched to more efficient sources of fuel. And we're at this nexus again, right? So we were focused on coal. There are obviously drawbacks to coal. As those were recognized, we switched to a more efficient fuel, right? So that became hydrocarbon. So we're now in this next transition. So for every switch we make, there's large gains to be had. You know, you switch from muscle power to steam power, right? That changed the way society operated. And I think, yes, geology got us here, but we've also been making improvements and we have the opportunity if we can focus these studies determine in advance what are the drawbacks, how do we effectively manage them so that in another 50 years we're not having this conversation about the extractive practices, right? So as we learn better, we do better, but that means we need people to be contributing to the conversation so that we can make these advances to better understand these systems. And there are two main reasons I really wanted to highlight this topic now. The first is that geoscience enrollment is currently declining. 
I've talked about this in depth in a previous video, so I won't go into detail now, but it really makes us as geoscientists and as educators wonder why are younger students, new students, not choosing to study higher temperature petrology or geochemistry as their discipline? Perhaps it's because a lot of people now are making decisions as they should be with environmental justice in mind and with the environment in mind and sustainability and perhaps the connections between high temperature geochemistry and petrology are not as obvious as in other disciplines, like where you're directly studying modern climate change. And like we've already hit on, that's just a misperception. We need geoscientists to make this green transition and to build a sustainable future. But the other reason I really wanted to bring all of this up now is because the current state of funding or shall I say defunding here in the US. This is something that's come up in every interview and that's deeply affected every geoscientist I've spoken to, regardless of their industry. And it really hit me when Michelle mentioned this as she explained why she and her colleagues decided to lead a research session about the societal relevance of petrology, volcanology, and geochemistry. It was in early February 2025, and there are some really interesting things happening politically. And I think that it was very easy as a scientist at that point to feel lost or undervalued. And so I just thought like, oh, this would be a really great way for like us to do something to point out what we're doing and why it's important and why we should continue to fund the sort of science. And obviously not all science funding will be lost, but the funding for science working toward a sustainable future most certainly will be. And again, a sustainable future does not mean cutting out all oil, gas, and mining. In fact, another thing I keep hearing from people, regardless of their industry, is this word, balance. There needs to be a better balance between extractions and the environmental health. So people used to do all sorts of things without any sort of consideration, right? And yeah. like, we're not stupid anymore. <laughs> we shouldn't do this anymore, right? Anymore. So we have the science and ability to, to do all these things now, to do better. There is a balance that we can strike, right? Like I am an environmentalist, but at the same time, like I understand the need to like keep my lights on. Like I understand that people use cars, you know, and I think a balance can be achieved, right? So you just kind of have to like find that sweet spot and, you know, you can do all these things while mitigating environmental impacts and plan for climate change. Like we can yeah. do all that stuff. So I want to be part of like steering the ethic compass and the morals of this industry in the right direction in the resource energy sector. I would argue that most materials that come out of mining are critical because even things like aggregates, they don't get near enough recognition, but they are literally like what our foundation of society is built on. So, you know, there's, there's lots of materials that we need. It's just how do we do it responsibly in a way that, that we are comfortable with in a way that doesn't have environmental impacts like it used to. We all understand the concerns around climate change. It's just that we can't do away with this completely yet and that it's fueling part of a lot of the transition and we still need it for that. So when I first saw this comment, I was like, I don't think there's any tension. I think we need each other to go yeah, to this singular. There needs to singular... be more people talking, exactly, as opposed yeah. to like the oil people being like, you green people are crazy. Yeah, the green no, people being like, you're destroying together. the environment. It's like, no, you need to work together. The hardest part about environmental consulting is you're earning your paychecks from these big mines that are putting out these chemicals, but you're earning that paycheck, keeping them in check. It is so important in today's world, making sure that these companies are staying within the environmental standards and not leaching these tailings of all these chemicals being left out. You know, they absorb into the air, the ground, the water, and there's a lot of communities nearby. And that is just like such an important thing. And it's, you know, there are people that will hear a conversation like this and go, well, we need to stop the mining or we need to stop the oil and gas. And we need to stop the things that are making these the water dirty yeah. and contaminated, but it's not that simple. We need the mining as as our previous guest just pointed out and we still need the oil and gas as julia pointed out. and it's like yeah. well we're phasing some of these things out and some of our practices out 
we will need these things moving forward for a long time. And whatever we end up transitioning to will still have adverse effects on the environment. We'll still always need to understand that and mitigate that. So it's never like we're not going to need people like you out there doing that. And it's so important for our environment and communities. So anyway, I wanted to highlight this concept of gray areas that I've been hearing so much about in my recent interviews. But I really do highly encourage you to check out the full interviews if you haven't yet. The recent one I did over on the Geo Society channel on the societal relevance of petrology, volcanology, and geochemistry was so eye-opening, and we got into way more than just critical minerals. We talked about carbon sequestration for climate change mitigation, increasing community resilience against earthquakes, volcanoes, and other natural hazards and even geology's role in space exploration, whether we're looking for life or extractable mineral deposits. So links to that video as well as the other ones I've referenced here will be down below in the description box. And with that, thank you so much for watching. I hope you will go out and do some geology of your own now, and I will see you guys in the next one.